Thanks for the kind introduction. And good morning, everyone. So uh, unlike many of my previous speakers, I have the pleasure to give some insights on ADS safety assurance from an applied research perspective, which is somehow a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we are not like uh, in time pressure and concrete projects that much, <laughs> as you are, or most of you are. But on the other hand, uh, you are also expecting something from us as an applied research organization, namely to provide methods to uh, actually realize the requirements that are posed by the ADS standards. So um, to somewhat localize myself a little bit in the not so small Fraunhofer Society, so uh, I'm part of the Fraunhofer Institute for Experimental Software Engineering. And uh, unlike what you may think, we don't develop software, but effectively we are uh, designing since 25 years methods, processes, and tools to actually develop software with uh, demonstrable quality. And uh, my role in this, as you heard, is actually the uh, yeah, lead of uh, the safety engineering department. And uh, yeah, in this role, actually, I have gained some insights uh, in the past research and um, yeah, also bilateral industry projects that we perform in this area, of which I will report today. But let me start with setting the stage, the promise. So in my observation, uh, if we look at uh, certain statements that have been done, for instance, by our transportation minister in 2023, it seems like safe automated driving is in reach or almost there. And uh, on the European level, uh, there are also already ongoing large-scale demonstration projects, which uh, have quite high funding volumes as well. And uh, the question is, are we there already? And uh, to answer this question, I'd like to give a little bit uh, on, let's say, the experiences that I was involved in. So I was part of the uh, Pegasus project family, which was one uh, project family of the VDA leading initiative, Automated Driving, uh, which consisted basically of three projects, Pegasus, Set Level, and uh, VVM. And uh, what we learned in those projects when it was started was basically that for ADS safety, we need something more than the classical development and uh, validation verification methods. And uh, Pegasus started off with a technical framework where we kind of transform the right side of the V into scenario-based testing approaches, but it rested more like on a basic technical and methodological framework on how to conduct this. Set level kind of transferred this into actually the simulation, so because we cannot test everything like in a physical uh, area, so we need to go in simulation. And in VVM, we quite quickly realized, okay, even if we have like a, a scenario-based right side uh, of the V, uh, there is no safety without proper systems engineering, without proper risk management processes, and also without an explicit argumentation why this is supposed to reach safety. So, and this is actually, let's say, one big part of the, uh, let's say, research uh, uh, knowledge that we have in Germany in this regard. So all of these projects had around like uh, 20, 30 million project volumes. And uh, similarly, and this is like what I separate out of my talk because it has been talked a lot, it's important, the AI part. But there was another project family consisting of, I think, five or six projects with similar sites which dealt specifically with the AI problem. So I, I had the link here and on the right-hand side. So this was accompanied actually by technical standardization. If we look at the, the timeline, um, yeah, there was like standards for, let's say, structuring the driving environment and also structuring the dynamic behavior of traffic participants. And uh, now next year we are going to have like a technical format standardization of uh, ODD descriptions. And uh, yeah, in addition to the technical standards, we also have like a lot of uh, standards and regulations that we can uh, actually draw upon in terms of requirements on what we have to do and also partly certain recommended methods on uh, how to achieve this. And the big question from my perspective is like, is this sufficient yet or are there maybe some methodological questions where we have the requirements yet what to do but not yet, let's say, a good understanding of how we achieve those requirements. And I want to pick out three of them today in my talk. And uh, yeah, these are not like all, of course, but uh, three that I, in my observation, found, uh, let's say, to be uh, with many of our customers, like, uh, let's say, challenging. So if we assume that uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the V can actually be uh, conducted by the methods proposed by these projects, then the big question is, can we deploy with a, let's say, controlled uncertainty and uh, actually an acceptable risk? And my answer to this is no. And the reason is that we have certain issues. Number one, 
is even though that we have like a technical representation on how to structure ODDs with open ODD, we don't know yet, yet actually whether the, the kind of view that we have on the operational environment is actually sufficient to do the job. So we don't know what to populate these models with yet in my view because as you will see like in a minute when I detail out the challenge, uh, yeah, this is like always it depends on which activity I conduct and which representation I need and which level of detail I need. The second aspect is uh, yeah, accounting for the fact that uh, after deployment there are certain, let's say, experiences <laughs> that uh, are simply not foreseeable before we deploy. So examples of those are actually behavioral distribution shifts of certain dynamic uh, yeah, people, vulnerable road, vulnerable road users, sorry, um, that we just cannot foresee. There are also like uh, aspects that, for instance, new standards come out that we need to adhere to. This is more like on the development and, and uh, organizational perspective. And, uh, but this needs to be somehow accounted for. And I think the most important aspect is the aspect of design assumptions that we just don't know whether they are valid. So we need to kind of substantiate this with goal-driven and database field monitoring to uh, yeah, manage this risk also in a systematic way. And the third aspect is actually, yeah, I'm, I'm telling this nowadays as like telling the system safety story uh, by means of an explicit and systematic argumentation. So uh, as you will see in, in uh, later slides, um, this is actually the challenge that a proper safety argument is not equal to using GSN, so which I also hear and experience often. So let's go into the first challenge. What do I mean by that? So when we are talking about environmental uh, representations that are consumed by safety engineering process, this is like the view that we see when we yeah, look at classical functional safety. So most of the environmental influence on our safety engineering activities is given by uh, the hazard and risk assessment processes. So the situations in which a particular hazard may yeah, be critical in, and therefore we need to do something about it by specifying safety goals and realizing an architecture that uh, satisfies those. So here, the, let's say, influence of the environment is focusing on the risk of consequences of a hazardous event. If we are now looking into, yeah, let's say, outside the scope of FUSA and looking like in the, in the complexity of the environment that ADS need to consume in order to take safe decisions, we are in the, let's say, sort of world. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, the major message here is that basically we not only like have uh, one environmental influence on the Hara side, so right side, so which is, by the way, even different for every risk parameter that I'm looking at. So the environment when I'm focusing on controllability aspects is different than the environment when I'm focusing how vulnerable in terms of severity is a particular um, uh, person or a person at risk. On the left-hand side, the environment has a different influence on our system, namely on the occurrence of the safety goal violation in the first place. So um, yeah, this can be substantiated when we, for instance, looking at triggering conditions. So triggering conditions may trigger a weakness which might be associated to sensor performance limitations. And these sensor performance limitations, they um, uh, yeah, are different actually for each physical sensing principle that I have. So again, I need a different view on my environment for a specific task. And uh, yeah, so uh, we heard it also in the previous talk, security is obviously a thing. Security threats may also lead to safety issues and safety goal violations, so that's why we need to cover this also in our safety security analysis. And uh, you can imagine the environmental perspective on, let's say, making sense of like how uh, security attacks and threats occur is completely different from what we know from safety. But in general, it's also the operational environment, it's just a different bit of it. And uh, what do I make out of this? Yeah, basically, we, sorry, basically we have uh, different tasks, you know, safety assurance, safety engineering, safety analysis tasks, which all need a different view. And now how, how do we do this? So there is not one ODD to rule them all. <laughs> Instead, we need to have some, sorry, some kind of a, baseline taxonomy, which is specified, for instance, in standards like ISO 34503, 
or there exist like more sophisticated models from VVM, like the six layer model, and there exist many more of those which have slightly different uh, focuses. And uh, what is required is actually a tailoring method which somewhat takes the quality criteria of a particular process, uses that baseline ta taxonomy, and uh, decomposes it into a tailored view on the environment, which we can all, which we can then beneficially use during our safety engineering activities. And this then leads to an, let's say, arguable artifact, uh, which is not just like this ODD, which uh, is a collective term for everything related to environment. And uh, these tailored views then can, of course, be uh, let's say formalized into standards like Open ODD. But the key, the key message here is like we need to understand what we t what, what, which view we want to have and which views we need before we can formalize it. So at Yesel, we have performed some work in the past years on this. So here are just some papers related. And uh, one thing that I would like to point out that uh, what we found is that for the task of situation space exploration and um, uh, view tailoring, so uh, LLMs also come in handy. So this is like one of the activities where um, where we found this helps like uh, simplifying the task and uh, assisting engineers to explore a fairly complex situation space um, when tailoring such a taxonomy. So the second um, big challenge that I see is the, the challenge express safety design assumption and validate them continuously based on data. So uh, here I already talked about uh, yeah, what, are, what is the, the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem is we have assumptions that we don't know whether they are true and we have these post deployment events and uh, yeah, that are somewhat unpredictable. So we know maybe which type of events may occur, but we don't know their frequency distribution. So we need to uh, kind of have methods to uh, address this. And uh, yesterday I was very happy to see the, uh, the talk by the ZF colleagues, uh, which kind of have a, a yeah, very systematic way in doing this. And um, yeah, actually the path 1881 from BSI specifies again requirements on what to do, but in my um, overview of the research field, there are not many like concrete methods on how to do this. And um, one thing that, or one concept that has been, that has emerged in this area is the concept of safety performance indicators. Uh, it was like, I mean, it's not a new concept, but now has a name. <laughs> and uh, basically this is, let's say, the philosophy on how also I think this will work. So. It's, it's probably not effective to collect all the data that you can collect and make something out of it, but always like to start with a particular goal. And this goal, by coincidence, uh, aligns very well with actually a goal structure that is yeah, uh, most of the times present in, a, in some kind of representation of a safety argumentation. So this means the goals come from our safety case, and in our safety case we are specifying now formalized metrics and let's say data items that we collect in order to specifically measure how far are we away from an unsafe state. Yeah. Not on the individual vehicle, but on the fleet level. And uh, in this regard, the, always the data that you collect is grounded in a particular idea on what I want to know afterwards. And uh, so this is something that at least in Germany has not like uh, been researched much in the field. So the, the only project uh, that I know about this is actually one that uh, also some colleagues in the room are involved in. Uh, and that is, uh, sorry, that is a, a BMBF project uh, that is yeah, running for two years and ending next year, which exactly deals with uh, post-deployment monitoring and realizing a safety DevOps reference process and is uh, therefore, let's say, uh, not uh, formally a continuation of the VVM project, but it addresses an important aspect in my view that is required. So update management uh, and kind of harmonizing this with the safety DevOps processes. So what do we do at YESA in this project? So um, on the one hand, uh, as I mentioned already, so there needs to be some kind of uh, way to specify in a formal manner what we actually want to monitor. And this is like by no means like uh, just uh, a no-brainer. Uh, it needs careful thinking about which goals actually need a substantiation at runtime and uh, whether the data that I can collect by means of, uh, let's say, my, my vehicle or in-vehicle uh, devices 
is actually uh, leading to proper conclusions that I can draw upon later, or whether there is just something I would need to know but I can't like because I can't measure it, so to say. And these gaps also need to be ad addressed in the operation safety case. And uh, yeah, when this is defined, and I think this is like the biggest problem still, so the definition of proper SPIs, then it can be like, uh, or needs to technologically be, be um, transferred into a, um, into a monitoring component. And the field data that is coming back, there is a particular challenge related to this because uh, usually the fleet operators are not like the experts of safety case, of safety artifacts, of, of any kind of documents who have the knowledge to know what do we actually do with that information if there is, let's say, some threshold violation that has been defined. And uh, therefore, um, on the, let's say, death and assurance side of things, what we are doing is that uh, basically we are trying to support the engineers with making uh, the change impact analysis. And this is again like a topic which somewhat uh, is a, let's say, a process methodological topic. So if there is like a, a, let's say, a field event or let's say a certain frequency of the of, uh, same field event, then what you need to know is, it, do I need to do something? Do I need to hold, hold operation of the fleet? Is this like a minor thing that I need to be more careful in the future for prioritization purposes? and uh, if, let's say, my assumptions are invalidated, then uh, I need to kind of plan a, a future, uh, let's say, a feature update that I need to roll out. And uh, this is like our contribution to this problem. The third challenge is related to the uh, assurance argumentation, documentation, and communication. So um, if we think about this, like, let GSN aside for a moment and think about, like, what is it actually that, that we are doing when we are performing, like, uh, sa safety engineering and validation verification. So what we want to know is the real risk that is associated with a product that I put into operation in my ODD. And uh, let's say, since we cannot measure this real risk, so to say, that even alone whether there exists an absolute value of this, uh, the only chance we have is to make a risk prediction by means of validation and verification methods. So this means that uh, basically we need to make sure from an argumentation standpoint that our predicted risk is never underestimating the real risk. So then we are safe with uh, maybe like some, some uh, let's say, uh, convenience problems that it gets more costly or so if we do more, but the, the thing is we need to make sure that this is not underestimated. And uh, now we can think uh, back, how is actually this influenced? Yeah, well, it is influenced by the processes that we execute for doing this verification and validation by means of our VNV system, as I call it. And uh, basically here we also see that the operational environmental analysis, operational environment analysis is basically um, has a dual role in this setup. Uh, the first role is the typical role that we somehow need to have a, a, a representation of our operational environment to actually build our system because we need to substantiate, for instance, what it means to uh, keep a safe distance. That's a nice requirement, but it's not operationalizable in terms of like uh, um, an implementation. So, and on, that, on the other hand, the operational environment analysis, and this is the focus that has been set a lot like in the, in the research project that I mentioned in the beginning was the VNV. So if we cannot even measure like how good we are, we don't need to start like uh, implementing it because we cannot check whether we achieved a sufficient level of uh, uh, risk yet. And um, this is so to say the reference process in which we uh, basically uh, operate and our argument needs to like make sure that all sources of inadequate risk prediction or estimation are actually controlled in a meaningful way. And uh, yeah, there's one thing since we, we, we cannot do everything. Yeah, so that there's also like a cost limit on what can be spent. So that's why actually there will necessarily be concerns by, let's say, engineers about like, is it really like if we use method one and two, like is this really doing the job for us? Yeah, this probably varies with, uh, with different um, organizations, with the maturity of processes, also with the experiences of, of uh, previous products. And therefore, like a, a very important part of systematic safety argumentation is to have like a process to identify concerns of like, individuals in my company and make sure that uh, we kind of constantly try to break our own uh, safety argument that we believe is valid. And uh, 
yeah, having this in mind, we can uh, look uh, at uh, basically what the challenge now is. So the challenge is basically that we have like three aspects that contribute to argumentation. The first, on the left-hand side, is our generic argumentation principle. So this is like what any argument, that even though that is not related, or it might not be related to uh, automated driving systems, yeah, uh, has certain aspects. It's about like how a system performs, yeah, so really like having the concrete evidence that a test has passed, for instance, yeah, that's like a performance, it's talking about the what. Then we talk about like are the processes somewhat uh, executed in a, in a meaningful way, and uh, you may ask yourself like why do I need this, because if the processes are not executed properly, then I will see it in my performance of the system that I test, but uh, since we do cannot test everything, see the refer to the cost limit, we need to kind of use our process as a way to bootstrap our argument for all those places where we don't test. This is like an additional security somehow. And the uh, last two parts are the confidence and the dialectics, and this is like related to this concern management that I thought. So really reflecting on Am I act, is my argument actually valid in a sense? Like everything that I did, why do I believe that this makes sense? And on the other hand, to somewhat uh, avoid confirmation bias, <laughs> we need to also have people that actually try to break the argument and uh, maybe try to find ways on why actually our argumentation might not be valid. And uh, when we want to come from these generic argumentation principles to a concrete safety argument for ADS, we need to think about assumptions about uh, validation verification and ADS engineering processes. And there exist like a lot of frameworks, yeah, so this is by no means complete. I just collected some, some of them from research, some of them from companies. So there exist different ways on how a safety argument can be structured, but in essence, all of them contain the same uh, basic principles, so to say. Some uh, of the companies also have different focuses based on, uh, let's say, regional legal systems, yeah. So, for instance, in the U.S., the post-deployment monitoring activities are usually uh, much stronger than it is in Europe. That's because, actually, we are doing type approval before operation, and that's a little bit different. And um, this is, like, the major part that matters. And uh, the last part, and this is, like, where GSON comes into play, is the part where I need to put my ideas on, let's say, those four dimensions of the um, argumentation into a concrete document so that I can communicate it with different stakeholders. And it is not that there is only one stakeholder, but there are multiple ones. There is like the, the uh, type approval authority, there is like, uh, for instance, an external, let's say, uh, certification agency like TÜV or something like this. There is also my internal people that I need to communicate uh, why they need to do certain things. I can use uh, safety arguments for, let's say, tracking progress in projects. And uh, depending on which type of uh, use case I have for using a safety argument, safety case, uh, also the structure looks different. So uh, a word about the difference between the how and the why. <laughs> so um, when we look on the left side, uh, the how is talking about uh, basically the concrete methods that are executed to actually get concrete evidence. Uh, and this is like testing and everything that we have seen in the, in the past project. And the transition needs to go more like in the direction of the why, where we say like we need to systematically find a way to reflect on uh, whether what we are doing is actually appropriate to achieve the goals that we set out. And um, when we are thinking, so uh, many of the discussions here at the OSS were very interesting in this aspect because um, yesterday in the talk about, from, from Eduard about safe AI, we were talking about metrics. Yeah? So we have an uncertainty whether the metrics we are using are correct. Yeah? On the other hand, we have methods which are not yet mature, which are new in the field. We have like uncertainty whether these methods are effective in doing the job. And constantly like also monitoring what actually uh, research insights um, uh, produce basically to be used, I think this is like a major aspect to, to make this self-reflection from a company point of view like systematic in a way and then put it like afterwards in a, in a safety case. And in the interest of time, I will jump one slide ahead and uh, 
look at uh, what do we in my research department do in this area. So I strongly believe that this is like a very, very important topic. Uh, of course, a little bit biased yeah, because I've been working in this like for a long time. But uh, um, we are actually um, yeah, having a, a standalone tool which uh, contains many of the advanced GSN implementation, uh, GSN features that other tools don't have. So for instance, in practice, we found that modularity is like something that is very important because if you start drawing a GSN, then actually it quite quickly gets uh, untractable. So this is like uh, a practical aspect that is very important. And uh, reflecting on what I said about uh, confidence and dialectic argumentation, it makes sense to separate a primary argument which talks about the what and the how from the argument uh, that actually talks about the confidence that I have in this. And this is like where assurance claim points come into play. This is like a feature that is standardized in GSN, but there is not a single implementation of this I know. And uh, we have implemented that because it's very useful in practice. And of course, everyone who, who manages concrete projects likes patterns because they make uh, the work more efficient, basically. And uh, this is also something that can be specified here. So one of the most important aspects uh, about GSN is like the argumentation always talks about something. It talks about actually all the work products that you have produced as part of your uh, yeah, safety engineering, safety validation activities. And uh, therefore traceability is an, sorry, is an important aspect. And uh, our answer to this is basically that since 20 years uh, in the institute, we are developing, let's say, uh, a meta model which uh, tries to fully integrate all the dependability artifacts on a very fine-grained level. So this is not on the level of I have a HARA document, but really also, let's say, making explicit the sem semantic relationships between uh, the content of these work products. And uh, by fusing the GSN implementation with this we call this digital dependability identity and is effectively a safety artifact and information graph. So we can establish like a formal traceability between the argument and all the artifacts that have been produced. And this uh, helps a lot because automation can be used for, for a lot of activities, for checking argument validity, for checking actually whether certain inconsistencies uh, um, uh, exist. And uh, this is very helpful. And this is actually the basis on where we start to think about safety performance indicator monitoring. Yeah? So I said safety performance indicators need to be built like on a, on a rational information basis on what we want to monitor. And in our, uh, let's say, uh, frown of our world, basically this, this database is the DDI. And uh, the safety performance indicators come from GSN. So coming to the end of my talk, so what are the key takeaways of it? So um, I didn't want to downplay in the beginning, so we achieved a lot in the, in the existing research projects already. But uh, I wanted to highlight a little bit that uh, not everything yet has been clarified. I mean, the discussions on this conference so far that I, that I had is like uh, an additional evidence of this. Yeah, so to, great to see that this is not just like a, an academic view but have it validated. So, and regarding the three challenges, I think the safety engineering community needs to tr transition in three ways. Number one is actually to coming from environment representation to methods for environment population. Yeah, and uh, this in a meaningful task-oriented way. The second is actually coming from this uh, residual uncertainty that we still have during deployment due to the reasons mentioned to kind of accounting this with an effective post-deployment monitoring. And the third aspect is really coming from the, let's say, uh, GSN-oriented uh, view on this is like what, uh, what is a safety case to uh, a stakeholder-oriented um, uh, systematic argumentation process uh, which can be defended against all the stakeholders that consume my argument. And with this, I'd like to say thank you.